Hello, I'm Mrs. Weisgerber. Welcome to my podcast on syntax. Syntax is the arrangement of words in a sentence, and this arrangement is one of the many complex choices that a speaker or author can make to serve a purpose. Speakers always have a purpose, but it's up to you and I to figure out what it might be. Careful examination of sentence structure can reveal a lot. Syntax is a word coined in the Age of Reason, about 1600. Its etymology, or word history, shows it was devised to describe a putting together or in order arrangement, syntax. Syntax as a word is related to tactics and the root tech, as in architecture and technology. The connotation or underlying meaning of the word syntax is that the arrangement of words in a sentence is an art form. I agree. Discussing word order in sentences assumes knowledge of a few terms. A simple sentence is also called an independent clause. It has a complete meaning without additional information like modifiers or dependent clauses needed. A simple sentence has a subject, verb, and a direct object. A sentence, in a nutshell, is a complete thought. Clauses are word groups containing a subject, verb, and any objects, complements, or modifiers. Phrases are word groups lacking a subject, verb, or both. They are incomplete thoughts. They often support the main clause by giving additional detail and information about the main subject and action. Compound sentences have more than one independent clause, but no dependent clauses. And finally, complex sentences combine independent and dependent clauses. Great writers vary the types and lengths of sentences to highlight and emphasize key ideas. Here's an example of a famous scathing architectural review of the Rayburn Building in Washington, D.C. Throughout the essay, the critic builds her case for the building's many failures. The few very short sentences in the essay are the ones where she expresses distaste most clearly and directly, as shown here. How do you like that circle? You might even say that that very short sentence would serve as a thesis. Syntax controls verbal pacing and focus. Although one hard and fast rule of standard edited English language is that there must be a subject and a verb, and the order of the words cannot be random, writers and speakers have a lot of leeway in how to embellish their ideas. This is why certain writers have personality or a strong voice. Besides word order, syntax is also concerned with sentence length, sentence focus, and punctuation. Word order is an interesting way of breaking up the choppy conformity of the subject-verb-direct-object pattern. If you analyze the works of great writers and use them as models for your own work, you'll see that great writers vary their sentence openings, the first few words of the sentence, in a way that creates interest for the reader. Here are some sample sentences that play with subject, verb, and object order. The first is a declarative statement. The second, an emphatic outburst. And the third characterizes the speaker by clarifying a state of mind. If you picture the speaker of each of these three sentences, you'll likely picture three different people as each sentence has a unique voice. One plain spoken, one excited, and the third perhaps irritated. That's how word order can bring an underlying meaning or connotation to what is said. Good writers also vary sentence length to keep the reader alert and to control emphasis. A short sentence following a very long sentence shifts the reader's attention, which highlights the meaning and importance of the short sentence. Oftentimes, 
modern writers put key ideas in short sentences, but this may not be the case when we read pre-20th century texts. Sentence focus is also controlled by the arrangement of words within the sentence. If the subject and verb are delayed or delivered at the end of the clause, this is a very strong effect. Because the subject and verb are delivered so close to the end of the sentence, where the period is found, these are called periodic sentences. Here's one. Although the sun beckoned delightedly and my phone buzzed a siren song steadily, I kept learning about syntax. This emphasizes the importance of this podcast. You see what I did there? If that sentence were reversed with the subject and verb at the beginning, the emphasis, of course, would be on all the enjoyable distractions that are being forsaken for knowledge. That style of sentence, which delivers the subject and verb early, is loose. Hear the difference. I kept learning about syntax, although the sun beckoned delightedly and my phone buzzed its siren song. Now the audience can relax with the subject and verb out of the way and savor the distractions. Stay with me now. Keen analysis of text also includes observations about other choices a speaker makes, especially repetition, the arrangement of words, sentences, or passages to mirror content, and punctuation. Each of these is a conscious choice the speaker makes, and each can have results that are purposeful, intentional, and engaging. Repetition is used by speakers and writers to emphasize important messages. Writers often repeat specially chosen words, sounds, or phrases to make a point, to stress certain ideas for the reader. Here's an example of using repetition to show anxiety in a character. predicted and prevented. We predicted it, didn't we? Hank and the others, they predicted it, but we didn't prevent it. We could have stopped it in 45 and 47. Besides the anxious or unstable, like this character in an old sci-fi short story, who else might repeat themselves? A speaker who wants to drive home an important point, a young child in the back seat of a car on a long road trip, an old person telling an often heard story, in a good writer's hands, repetition is intentional and has a purpose. A very sophisticated analysis may even show that repetition can be used to mirror content. Sentence structure can mirror content if the ideas are carefully arranged and syntax is arrangement. Other groupings that lend cadence or rhythm to prose include trinities, which would be three parallel groups of words, usually separated by commas, which create a poetic rhythm or add support for a point, especially when the three word groups have their own modifiers. Here's a sample of an action trinity plus sound trinity. Reaching into his cabin, Commander Cruin lowered his bulk into the seat behind his desk, took off his heavy helmet, and adjusted an order of merit which was hiding modestly behind its neighbor. Punctuation. Our final discussion on the arrangement of complete thoughts into sentences, or syntax, would not be complete without some mention of punctuation. Punctuation in its true historical sense is a means of marking or puncturing thoughts with important marks or dots. Think about it. A slash mark still carries with it the meaning of a cutting stroke with a weapon. A comma has the connotation of striking or beating as a drum. Punctuation provides pause as readers come to understand the relationships between ideas within sentences and sentences within the larger text. Here's guidance on particularly effective marks. The semicolon, the colon, and the dash. First, the semicolon. Are they weak periods 
or strong commas. They are part period and part comma after all. They're commonly used to indicate a close relationship between two independent clauses. A semicolon gives equal weight to two or more independent clauses in a sentence. It provides parallel structure or syntactical balance. It balances grammatical structure in a way that mirrors the equal weight or importance of the ideas or contents of the different parts of the sentence. It also connects closely related ideas. Here's an example. Education is a high word. It is the preparation for knowledge and it is the imparting of knowledge in proportion to that preparation. Without the semicolon, one could simply present the two clauses as separate sentences. With the semicolon, however, we strengthen the worthiness of preparation and imparting by connecting it to the high ascribed to education. The colon directs the reader's attention to the words that follow. It's also used between independent clauses if the second summarizes or explains the first. A colon sets the example that important, closely related information will follow and words after the colon are therefore emphasized. You would use a colon in replacement of the words note what follows. You would use it before a list of items especially after expressions like as follows or the following. In this first example, the colon signifies an important formal statement is following. Patrick Henry concluded his revolutionary speech before the Virginia House of Burgesses with these ringing words, colon. The important words follow. In the second, the colon serves to clearly delineate an important list. The dash, which is a lot of fun, marks a sudden change in thought or tone. It sets off a brief summary or sets off a parenthetical part of the sentence. It often lends a casual tone to the work. It's emphatic and it adds a bit of urgency. Here's a couple examples. A majority of the class of 2014, 55% in fact, was admitted to Ivy League schools. This material, are you even listening for gosh sakes, is very important. You can hear that dash. More about the dash. In this sentence, you can hear the clarifying pause in the voice as the appositive is stated. According to the Constitution, only one person, and that would be the President, can appoint justices. In this second example, the dash is replacing namely, in other words, that is, or some similar expression. His decision to stay in AP language was based on one thought. The honors and college prep courses could not provide him with the syntax challenges he craved. <laughs> so why syntax? Why does it matter? Well, a speaker's or writer's attitude or tone toward the subject is revealed by their choice of words, that's diction, the details they include or exclude, the imagery presented, and the word arrangement. Tone is how the author and audience connect. If you can understand rhetoric, which is a speech, speaker's use of any available means to inform, entertain, or persuade, you have a better chance of increasing your understanding of others. Being successful in your own communications and upping your shot at a qualifying score on the AP Language and Composition Test. Thank you very much for listening to today's podcast on syntax. I'm Mrs. Weisgerber.